Hello, and welcome to the MadeCast, the official podcast of the Museum of Art and Digital Entertainment, a series of lectures on video game history as part of the MADE's ongoing effort to preserve history through teaching and displaying playable exhibits of rare games and consoles. While life in the time of COVID has forced us to close our doors, for now, the support of people like you has allowed us to continue to bring history to you through lectures and interviews like the one you'll hear in a few minutes. I'm Red. I'm Anthony. I'm Miles. And I'm Chun. This week, we'll be talking about Kirby in honor of his 30th birthday, as we talked about last week. We'll be talking about his path over the years and some landmarks of his history as Nintendo's backup mascot. There's a lot of history involved with Kirby. He's definitely maintained his strides. Uh, we uh, have the new release of Kirby in the Forgotten Land, the 3D platformer from. Kirby, which looks incredible. Can't wait to get my hands on it as well. But for now, we have a little bit of news to get into. Yeah. So first off, does anyone remember Crisis? I do. I really love Crisis Free. I loosely remember Crisis. I never got, I never played Crisis, but I know it was very big in some of my circles of friends before they so it's, dove into. I love I love the game, I love the gameplay, I love the idea of being invisible and stealth kill, and I also love the fact it burns out my mm-hmm. display card. So its biggest claim to fame was being incredibly graphically intensive and really just very poorly optimized. Uh, so it was sort of a benchmark of, hey, your computer is good enough to run Crisis. Um, it's gotten better over the years, it's not really at the peak of the game anymore, but... Um, Crytek is currently hiring developers and positions for Crisis 4, which is based on the position still pretty far off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so don't hold your breath for it, but it's on the way. I feel like I have been waiting for that forever. They, they do have some like handover, not yet to be done thing by the end mm-hmm. of Crisis 3. And I really hope they pick them up. The story is actually pretty fun too. It'll be fun to see how it goes after all those stuff happens in Crisis Three. I wonder what's the sign-on bonus? Free nano suit. Uh, in other news, uh, the first two Elder Scrolls games, Arena and Daggerfall, are now free on Steam. Ooh, of course, get of your... course, Elder Scrolls. Do anything but release Elder Scrolls Six. <laughs> uh, like, uh, everything but that. Uh, <laughs> apparently has been their motto for the past few years i think they're probably but, waiting for ps6 to come out to release the game i mean what it's been 12 years 11 years since skyrim was released it's awesome i love i love waiting uh a decade plus for the sequel to a game i mean i'm used to it i was a kingdom hearts fan so it's long uh, enough for a child to grow <laughs> up well if you're interested yes. in an even bigger game than skyrim uh <laughs> technically Arena and Daggerfall basically encompass all of Tamriel. Um, mm. You can travel all of it, the whole thing. There's not very much there, uh, but technically but... you are <laughs> tr- crossing the whole map. Uh, but no, both games are good. They're very arcane and difficult to master. Um, I'll say diplomatically. <laughs> they, they have aged. <clears throat> well, I, I would think hope so. They're still worth looking at. Uh, they're still they're still worth playing, but the the gameplay of Elder Scrolls games has substantially shifted in a more friendly direction. Um, in other news, uh, we have news that the development work on Prince of Persia uh, will be handed over to Ubisoft Montreal. I guess if you're waiting for that game, you may have to wait even longer. I, I'm excited for this. I mean, like uh, I played the Sands of Time religiously. Uh, on my PlayStation 2. I, that was one of my favorite games as a child. I'd never got my hands on too many of the sequels for it. The Sands of Time was a great 3D like platforming RPG. I, I just loved the, the different moves you had to do. Just the getting around the map was just so much fun. I'm excited to see what the new one will bring. In other news, Blizzard uh, released the first Warcraft mobile game. Uh, Warcraft Arclight Rumble. Tell us a little bit about this game. It looks a little bit more like, I don't know, you, we all probably know the, the, the game Clash Royale. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it looks like that. 
So it's they're basically taking away from Clash of Clans and then just putting Warcraft characters. I awesome. guess. I mean, it's, a, it's actually the first... Is it the first move uh, Blizzard ever done to... Oh, no, it's not exactly the first move, but it's probably the... I don't know whether it, it, it has matters to deal with the, the, the Microsoft move or not, but... But we'll I see. mean, we'll see. Yeah, they're gonna bring back Windows form, Windows Phone for Warcraft Arclight Rumble. Uh, <laughs> hmm. You know, broaden their horizons Break again. Your Zune. Yes. Oh my God, that would be that would be so that would be pretty awesome if they released a, a game that you had to play on a Zune, and then bring them all back from storage. <laughs> In our last little bit of news, Miles, do you want to take this one? Yeah. So Dorf Romantic is finally out. Uh, this is a little German indie game uh, released by Tucana Interactive, which is for German students who made it over a weekend as a as a game jam project and started a studio and finished it. It's very charming. It's basically just building a little little town out of uh, little hex tiles. There's no. Um, it's it's just you know it's fun. You don't have you don't have it's to nice. save the world. It, it yeah, you're not saving the fun. world. You're not fighting anybody. You're just putting down buildings and animals and. Yeah, that sounds fun already. It it looks like Catan on steroids. It's it's kind of Catanish. Uh, it's it's a point building game. Uh, you get points based on the adjacency of various tiles to each other. So you want uh swamps next to swamps. You want rivers connecting to rivers, buildings for towns next to each other. A locomotive will want more locomotive tiles along it to to have a longer line. Various animals will want more uh, trees in a forest. Uh, and the game just stops when you run out of tiles and you get more tiles as sort of rewards for completing objectives. So it's a question. Mm. It's like a how long can you keep it going kind of game. And Interesting. I've, I've had a lot of fun with the um, early access version of it um, and it's finally released now. So it's it's a fun, chill game. Well, I think that is all the time we have for the news at the moment. So it is time to throw it on to the history of the Pink Devil. Kirby. And welcome back to the Maid Cast. Here we are once again. We are going to be talking about the history of Kirby uh, for his 30th anniversary and the launch of the new game, Kirby and the Forgotten Land. But let's get started on some of the original, some of the origins of Kirby and how he got his start. What led him to go into where he is right now? Mm -hmm. So, so we're going to start off a bit with the uh, dev team behind Kirby, uh, HAL Laboratory, formerly shortened as Halkin. It's a video game company that's headquartered in Tokyo. Uh, it was founded in 1980, and from the start has been largely independent, but was very closely tied with Nintendo and was kind of considered a second party, not really first party, not really third party. Yeah, they're. they're very closely interrelated and uh, lots of support from Nintendo directly. Uh, one thing we dug up that I think is kind of funny is that their name comes from being one letter before IBM. So H-A-L is one letter before <laughs> IBM, which is actually the same story as Arthur C. Clarke in Space Odyssey. Mm -hmm. the, the, the AI in, on the spaceship in that, in that story also has the initial H-A-L and... I think it's not confirmed, but it was for essentially the same reason. So HAL is obviously most famous for all the Kirby games, but it also worked on the Mother series, as well as the first couple Smash Bros. games. It, it, yeah, like the, the Mother series was like really interesting. I, I think people don't necessarily fully, nowadays, don't realize that, it was the, that it's the same developers. Uh, it does have like a very similar... Very similar chibi design to Kirby, but just with people instead of pink blobs and penguin kings. <laughs> I mean, we should talk about Mother sometime because that is a extremely seminal franchise that a lot of people are sort of picking up on again. And yes, um, I'm very happy Nintendo decided to finally release beginnings on Switch. Yeah. So, but its day will come, but it's not today. That is not today. Hal's logo. Uh, is originally called the Inutamago, uh, which is uh, shows like a wiener dog incubating some eggs. Uh, they 
made it their logo uh, since 1998, and that has been like the seminal thing that you will see in many of their games, including every intro to Kirby. You'll see the HAL Laboratory wiener dog incubating some eggs. Uh, HAL Laboratories originally started off by making games for uh, MSX and the uh, Commodore VIC-20. Uh, after financial trouble uh, with the development of Metal Slater Glory for the original NES, the Famicom, Nintendo offered to rescue HAL Laboratories from bankruptcy on the condition that Satoru Iwata was appointed as its president. Iwata later became the president of Nintendo. Like you said, secondary support for Nintendo later became main support. Uh, <laughs> it was like, we want you to take over and help run this thing. <laughs> you seem to know what you're doing. So the story behind Kirby was, I think the first one came out in 92. And it was designed as a basic platformer, sort of straightforward, designed for people who are unfamiliar with more complex uh, games, action games, shoot 'em ups. This was supposed to be a fairly easy entry level game. And I think a lot of the charm from it comes from them sticking to that formula very strictly, but still having a lot of room to have character in it. Like, it's not necessarily like, Okay, all of the Kirby games are not necessarily difficult, but they make up for it by being very, very charming and full of character. Wasn't the pink blob design, like, that wasn't that a placeholder? Yeah. Uh, originally, it wasn't even meant to be the original, the total design. Yeah, he was just a ball so that they could keep working on, on and start doing, uh, like, other programming, but they just liked the ball design so much that they kept it and just cleaned it up a little. And then made him pink. Mm -hmm. Although the original release was on was orig originally released on the Game Boy, so like with the monochrome screen, uh, lots of the art in like America and Japan made him just a black and white character. Mm -hmm. That's why you see in the in the box art for some of the early Kirby games, he's just white, and it looks very strange now because you know that he's pink. But back then, there was no color. We didn't know. No, well. Us Americans didn't know. A lot of the box art in Japan remained pink, but North America had some weird things about changing some Japanese games, such as just, yeah, we prefer them to be black and white rather than pink in the originally. But now it's pink is synonymous with the, the gluttonous blob. Gone around eating things across the lands and has made his way into our hearts. Um, so also... Kirby's original name was Popopo, a counter to Dedede, the, the king penguin of the area. I think there was another interesting story, there's some kind of some contested stories about how he, they got his name to Kirby. One story was that there was a lawsuit with Nintendo, with I think like the Kirby Vacuum Company, mm -hmm. and then someone's lawyer, once they like settled it or whatever, the lawsuit was over. They sent Kirby a copy of the game and just made that his name as a kind of like a, ha ha, we win. <laughs> like, hmm. uh, he apparently got a kick out of it. Kirby started out in very honest roots. Like the Kirby that we know now inhales enemies and transforms into different creatures based on their powers. But in the original game, there was no abilities. It was purely just the inhaling of enemies and spitting them back out inhaling air just to float up and get some more platforming higher up. Uh, there was quite the interesting launch to his stuff mm -hmm. uh, as just a simple evolution. Then the next game uh, in 93 was released on the NES. That was the first instance where Kirby started getting his transformation powers. He had seven initial abilities, I believe. So there was the cutter, which is like boomerang swords. There was the light beam, which is just like a light beam straight up and down. There was the lightning little spherical bubble that you can just charge up, turn into a little lightning ball. There was a flamethrower. I believe there was like a hammer Kirby as well. There, there's so many initial things that have made their way through every Kirby game since almost. Mm -hmm. Started off in the first NES release. Also... Uh, one of the last games released on the NES originally in 93. The rest would then be released on Game Boy Color and the and Super Nintendo later on. Uh, but as far as that original title, uh, the only thing that really 
came of came of it was the remaster for the Game Boy Advance in 2002. Yeah, that was that was Kirby's Nightmare in Dreamland. I think that was well, that was my first experience with Kirby. Um, that was mine as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I'm also like never realized uh, until doing some more until later on that that game was also just a remaster of the first game, mm-hmm. uh, which was also just a great game. Uh, there was, it was endlessly fun. Uh, like you said, not very hard, but very endearing. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the different enemies and characters were so involved and well-designed and just cute. Just super cute, as most of Kirby is meant to be. As far as main releases for games, there was a couple other like ad- adventures, uh, Kirby's Adventure, and some other ones throughout the years. There was a, the Dark Matter trilogy, uh, was started with the Kirby's Adventure, and then went till the, I think Kirby's Dreamland Three, uh, was the end of that saga. Of uh, mm-hmm. like evil darkness and you trying to save Dreamland from the endless sleep or the gluttonous uh, food stealings of their king. Uh, <laughs> but there was a uh, because of Kirby's simple ball design. There was also a lot of amazing spinoffs and kind of side games that came with that. Uh, one of the most not- notably was the Tilt and Tumble. Uh, it was a Game Boy game with an accelerometer in the cartridge, uh, which allowed you to actually move the Game Boy uh, to control the direction that Kirby was going. And I, like, I just thought that one was a very notable, interesting game to go. All of the... Um, what I think is interesting is all of the mainline games follow a fairly similar formula. And this is true for a lot of different franchises. Like the, the mainline games follow a structure. They're all 2D side scrollers, uh, except for Forgotten Land, which we'll get to. But like, yes, they have the same basic formula. They don't really experiment too wildly. They just sort of do the same good thing over and over again. What's really interesting about Kirby is that all of the spinoffs are just wild. Like, oh, yes, there is an entire like. Each new game is an entirely new way to play as Kirby. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, Canvas Curse, you were painting lines on the DS touchscreen, uh, so you controlled Kirby not using any of the buttons, but just by having him gain momentum, mm-hmm. rolling down, like, ramps that you drew on screen. Um, I mean, Kirby's Air Ride was s- star surfing. God, so, Kirby's Air Ride was like, great. I only played that a few times, but I remember just having a bunch of times, a bunch of fun times racing with my friends. I mean, I remember specifically in uh, Nightmare in Dreamland, the remaster, just the, the air ride was just like an end event uh, on some levels where you were just racing to get to the bonuses mm-hmm. at the end against the three other differently co- colored Kirby balls. It's definitely come a long way since. I mean, there was Kirby's Dream Course as well, which was like a golf-based game mm-hmm. with Kirby's abilities. Um, notably, something interesting about uh, Kirby's uh, Dream Course as well. Uh, the, the Let's Players, uh, the Game Grumps on YouTube, there was a large fan-made uh, mod of the game called Grump's Dream Course, Mm -hmm. which they animated those characters as Kirby chibis. And then they, I think there was over a hundred different fan-made new levels just for that game as well. Uh, It's like, if you want to give that a shot, uh, check that out on YouTube as well. But it's, it's really interesting to see how much people have like fallen in love with Kirby so much. And then just to, make their own versions of it. Mm -hmm. Um, It's quite incredible. An interview I pulled up from some of the developers behind the Kirby games really talked about the sort of philosophy behind their their design principles, and they talked about uh, every game in the series being approachable but deep, 
meaning that mm-hmm. it's it doesn't take a whole lot to really understand what you're trying to do and how to do it. And the depth comes from having interesting uh, areas to explore, having rich world building, uh, you know, fun boss encounters, uh, appealing design. Like, not necessarily, oh, this is a difficult game, but oh, this is something that is engaging really like it's not it's not about challenging the player it's about making the player have a good time which i think is a great philosophy to have honestly especially coming off of um from soft oh yeah no exactly i was just about to say it's like almost the exact opposite of from soft it doesn't need to be hard in order to be entertaining or from soft is like must be hardest game ever that's how fun that's how you get fun Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh but Kurt, like the approachability of Kirby games lends itself a lot more. I mean, because even with some Mario games, like Super Mario World had a lot of complex platforming uh, and different abilities that you could get, that, which really kind of upped the difficulty of the game compared to like, like Super Mario Bros. and like some of the original ones. Uh, it's quite a different... Mm-hmm. It's a different experience. Uh, Kirby is, I think, one of the most approachable games that anybody could get their hands on and start out with. They've finally released their newest entry into the series, uh, Kirby and the Forgotten Land, uh, earlier this year, as of uh, in April. And it is the first foray into a 3D world with Kirby in it. Uh, Mm -hmm. There were other games like Kirby's Dream Land 2 and Dream Land 3 on the SNES uh, had some 3D backgrounds and same with uh, Kirby 64, the Crystal Shards. It was still the side-scrolling aspect, but just in 3D. Mm -hmm. So you were still moving to the left, but at like a slight angle so you could see you're moving diagonally as opposed to just left and right across the screen. Kirby's transformation and invention has been changing throughout the course of all of the games. Uh, I mean... Kirby's epic yarn was a ridiculous change of pace, completely revamping how Kirby operates, uh, while also still keeping the adorable, cute aesthetic that Kirby has, but just with uh, yarn strings instead of the pink little inhalant blob. They they did sort of the same thing with Yoshi. Like Yoshi, I think we could also talk about in having sort of some of the same characteristics as Kirby. The 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 yarn games were a very interesting diversion from or divergence from like what Nintendo was normally doing. And I really enjoyed the yarn games because they were just so offbeat and pleasant. It was a, it was a totally new, unique Kirby experience from everything else while still mm-hmm. maintaining like the feel of a Kirby game. Yeah. Uh, and you don't really see a lot of reinventions of games that still keep true to that uh, today. We are running up on time. Uh, do you want to talk about the anime and the manga that came from Kirby? Uh, yes. Very briefly. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so Kirby also had a manga series uh, that ran from 1994 to 2006 called Kirby of the Stars. The story of DDD who lives in Poopapoo. I mean, the entire manga was 10 million copies printed, uh, total 25 volumes. It wasn't until 2010 uh, that it was released in English as Kirby Manga Mania by Viz Media. It was later uh, published as like a best of collection, uh, which had new chapters uh, from the continued serialization as well as other things as well. Uh, But Kirby also had an anime called Kirby Right Back At Ya, which debuted on 4Kids TV, RIP. The anime series had its own universe separate of the games. Masahiro Sakurai, the creator of Kirby, was greatly involved in it, so it's still kind of held true to how Kirby should act, uh, as well as uh, Sakurai's big influence into Kirby. Kirby does not speak in full sentences. Like Honestly, like he wanted to be more like Snoopy from Peanuts, allowed him to use very simple words. His most famous catchphrase, Poyo and the names of various attacks and characters. Kirby was also released in an educational video in Japan in 1994 to help teach kanji to young children, the written language of Japanese. So he's been 
helping children play games and learn their language, uh, get top marks on their languages uh, for a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and now with the 30th anniversary, Kirby and the Forgotten Land is the next big leap uh, and jump into the future for Kirby. He has had other experiences with Smash Bros and other appearances in other games, mm -hmm. but Kirby's in the Forgotten Land is the latest and greatest in the evolution of Kirby and his gluttonous, inhalant behavior. So we want to salute you to Kirby, salute you to Sakurai for creating one of uh, Nintendo's greatest characters. Absolutely. And I think that's just about all we have on the history of Kirby for you today. <laughs> Welcome back. So, before we wrap up, what has everybody been playing? Anybody, anything new? Anything interesting? I know you said you've been playing the Dwarf Romantic early access game for a while, and you've been enjoying that, Miles, but mm -hmm. nothing new on my gaming front. Still dipping toes into Elden Ring, spending a little less time focusing on some more life stuff right now, but, you know, such is life. Have you guys uh, ever tried any of the Wordles? Uh... I've tried a couple Wordles. I've played. I've tried to do some of them with like my roommates when they were just putting it out, just guessing a few things. Apparently, there's like a cheese you can kind of do. Like, if you're unsure of the word, there's like three words that you can do with the first that include a majority of like the most popular letters. <clears throat> oh right, yeah, and, and there's like a a do. I think is how you, a do story, yeah, like right? Yeah, like raise is also a good one because it has R and S and then three of the vowels. But it's it's a very interesting and fun game. I'm yet to dip my toes further into that one, but it's seems very entertaining, very easy way to pass the time and have some good fun. So there's there's Wordle, right? Have you tried Worldle? No. What is Worldle? <laughs> yeah, Worldle. Um, it's pretty much the same uh, premise. You have five guesses, but you have to guess uh, what country um, or what landmass you're looking at. Oh, so it's a geoguesser, it's a, essentially. It's a geographic, yeah. <clears throat> okay. It's a little bit more challenging, um, but you get sort of uh, clues as to the direction and how close you are to the actual place. And Interesting. And yeah, there, there's a lot of like sort of you know, unrecognizable land masses out there or islands. Like, you know, just, there'll be an island kind of way off in, you know, the Pacific Ocean. Like, what? This is island? Yep, it is. Guam. It's always Guam. Guam is fine. <laughs> <laughs> Guam but is good. There's, okay, so there's world hole, and then there's herd hole. Like, which herd of animals are you looking at? <laughs> Uh, you're given a small snippet of a song, and you have to guess what the song oh. is. Oh. Okay. I think huh. I've, I've heard of it. That's like that, uh, I don't know, there's like that one game show that where you have to guess the song within, again, you're given like a second, then you're given like a couple seconds. That, like, I, I like that game. I can give that a shot. I feel like Try it's, all not, these it's, guessing not, games. it's not that difficult to recognize which song it is, but sometimes you remember the name of the, of the song is really difficult. Especially when songs, like, are not named the most repeated line in the chorus. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, the king's lament. Like, do 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 ouch, I fell. do 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 ouch, I fell. <laughs> I don't know. What? Broken, you know what, I, I think believe, we're going to have to call but... it there. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it's time to call it. Cue, cue the ending music. Red's had enough. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Done for the day. <laughs> I'm losing it. I'm losing it, everybody. Uh, <laughs> but it's all good. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Maidcast. Uh, <laughs> we want to thank you for listening to the Museum of Art and Digital Entertainment's official podcast. If you have any thoughts, questions, corrections, or general museum ideas, please shoot us an email at info at the maid org. And also with <clears throat> also with the reopening of the Maid. Uh, coming up in a very short time frame. Uh, anyone who wishes to help with the cataloging, which can be done remotely, please shoot an email to the info and we'll be glad to get you in 
to the Slack channel to help do what we all do at the maid um, if you want to be a part of it. So that email is your lifeline. Info at themaid.org. We'd like to send out a big thank you to everyone who donated recently and to our patient supporters who keep the maid afloat. Patient donors get to listen to this podcast one week before it's released on major streaming services and continue that with future episodes every week. This week's episode was brought to you in part by Patreon donors Jessica Sexton and Phil. Thank you so much for your support. Until next time, I'm Red. I'm Miles. I'm Chin. And I'm Anthony. Thanks. We'll see you next week.